The route to your intermediate destination is being calculated. Hey, who's driving this car anyway? We'll find out this week on Motoring 99. TSN's Motoring 99 is brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oils, formulated for the vehicles you drive and the way you drive them, and Midas Car Care, the way it should be. You know, I remember the days when driving meant simply getting in your car, turning the key on, rolling the window down, and pushing the AM button. Well, along came power steering and power windows and even FM radio, which just made the driving experience that much more enjoyable. But boy, have things changed. And the new Mercedes S-Class for the model year 2000 is a good example. First, it marks a new direction for Mercedes, but secondly, it marks what has become in the auto industry a technological revolution that will simply change the way we drive. Now, is this good or bad? We'll talk more about that later, but first, let's check out the new vehicle. Life has been good for Mercedes-Benz. In 1992, it sold just over 3,000 cars in Canada. In 1998, that figure jumped to more than 9,000, an increase of 180%. And who would have believed the biggest seller would be a truck, albeit a Mercedes truck with the M-Class. But the M-Class, along with the SLK and CLK, have not only been money makers, they've signaled the company's desire to create a new image and attract new buyers. I think uh, when you go back for the last two, three years and you look at all the new models, we have brought uh, all the new models, our competitors have brought, yes, people want something different. And uh, I mean, there's no doubt this is the most important model for us. I mean, it's the S-Class, it's the top of the line. It, uh, this car is going to set the standards and technology and innovation and safety. So for us, this is the most important car, yes. Yeah. Until now, the oldest model in the Mercedes lineup has been the S-Class, seen here during a test drive on Motoring 92. We conducted an abbreviated version of our usual skid pan tests because the S-Class is a luxury touring sedan and not a sports car. But that was in 1992. Today's S-Class is not your average Mercedes luxury boat. The S430, for example, comes equipped with a new V8 and 275 horsepower, while the S500 jumps to 302 horses. The S-Class also comes with an air ride suspension that automatically lowers the vehicle by 15 millimeters at 140 kilometers an hour for less drag. The car is a completely different look, I think, for Mercedes. It certainly uh, lays that stuffy old Mercedes image to rest. Uh, I don't know what the uh, the burgers and their frows are going to think of it. Uh, you know, never mind the Swiss banking community. You know, the car is an optical illusion. You know, it's just a little bit smaller than the old one, but it both looks and feels uh, to drive like an E-Class. Um, they managed to lose 300 kilograms of weight off the car. That's about 650 pounds for the metrically challenged, and uh, you really feel that. Uh, they're certainly looking for new drivers and they do, do have a new image. Uh, the styling is more contemporary and more keeping with the new type of styling we see every day from the various manufacturers. It's probably going to bring back the old customers and appeal to younger buyers, people who are just getting into the mid 40s, early 50s and starting to earn some good money. So on first impressions, it looks like Mercedes has hit the mark with the new S-Class. But this car is also as high-tech as they come, with over 60 different computer systems on board, including the cockpit management system, which had a few journalists grumbling that it was just another reason to take your eyes off the road. I, I uh, have mixed feelings about it. I, I think what they're doing with it is, is great. Uh, it's providing the, the driver with a lot more information and with a lot more capability. I have some reluctance uh, with the complexity of the system uh, and some concerns about, uh, for example, taking your eyes off the road to actually use a computer screen. 
I think that might be true, uh, or all of these types of technology have that inherent in them. But I believe that after spending a few minutes with it, you'll find that it's very, very easy. It's very uh, uh, soft on the customer. And uh, it does require a little bit of an adjustment at first, but I think later, within a very short period of time, they're, they're well adjusted to it and it's very, very easy to use. But I think uh, in the long term, of course, these kinds of things uh, do distract from your driving a little bit, but uh, I think uh, this vehicle is very, very good for that. I think it's just keeping up with the competition. Everyone has got a great degree of technology in the car, but I personally think the driver of this car is probably going to read the manual and just use the CD the radio, the cassette, and the phone. But quite frankly, learning to use uh, all the function of this car is going to be like learning a new computer application. It's not just hop in the seat and drive it. Who is Francis Fukuyama? Why are we at Niagara Falls? And what does any of this have to do with the new Mercedes-Benz S-Class? Well, all this and more will be revealed later on Kenzie's Corner. Not only does the G20 boast a world-class structure, it's welded together in a one-shot process. This delivers a body with dimensions that are accurate to within the thickness of a sheet of paper. Regular viewers of motoring may remember our initial test of our long-term Infiniti G20. Well, after disappearing for a year or so, it's back and with a vengeance. Up front, the G20 uses a modified McPherson strut design that incorporates an upper control arm. In back, the suspension marries a conventional multi-link system with a torsion beam axle. At the heart of the design is a special lateral link. As well as keeping the axle located from side to side, it ensures that the wheels remain perpendicular to the tarmac throughout the range of suspension travel. It also minimizes caster and camber change. Standard anti-roll bars, engine speed sensitive rack and pinion steering and a set of P19560R15 tires rounds out an impressive package. This G20 is without question one of the best cars I've ever pushed through the pylons. And given that it's front wheel drive, that's remarkable. It's balanced, agile, and the turn-ins are like lightning. The other thing is, it's almost devoid of vices. There's no body roll and very little understeer. Very well done. An unexpected bonus comes in the form of the overall ride comfort. It's compliant without being soft and it absorbs expansion joints without the usual fuss. Beneath the hood sits the G20's Achilles heel a 2.0-litre inline-four that develops 140 horsepower and 132 pounds-feet of torque. While it uses twin overhead cams and four valves per cylinder, it does not offer the sort of performance the car cries out for. In fairness, when matched with the five-speed manual box featured in our tester, the pickup is passable. Matched with a slush matic it would get the gong if this were the gong show. This G20 is one of the very few front-wheel drive cars to feature a limited slip differential. In essence, what you have is a viscous coupling linking the left and right front wheels. In the event that one starts to spin, the viscous coupling shuttles the power to the other wheel. Now, why so rare? Because in a front-wheel drive car, this technology has proven to be very unreliable, and it also feeds back through the steering wheel, neither of which is the case with this G20. Stopping power comes from a four-wheel disc brake design that uses the latest anti-lock technology. Dropping the anchor from 80 produced stopping distances that measured 115 feet. While the pedal feel is above average, the ABS shows up a little too early for my tastes. With the previous car, there was a lack of legroom. Not so on the new vehicle. They've stretched the wheelbase by about two inches and given you an inch and a half of that for the rear seat passenger. So there's now plenty of legroom, although the same can't be said for the amount of headroom. The seats are of the deep dish variety, providing large base and backrest bolsters. Strangely, the driver gets some power functions as well as a manual adjustment for the seat cushion, while the passenger has to do with a bog standard seat. So much for equal opportunity. The trunk is well shaped, benefits from 60-40 split folding rear seats and the use of cantilever hinges on the deck lid. The latter allows you to use all of the space in the trunk. 
You know, this new G20 has got an almost Jekyll and Hyde personality. On the one hand, it handles like the Dickens and just about better than any front driver I've ever driven. Conversely, it's under-engined and quite badly so. This thing needs at least another 25 horses to give it performance that matches its handling. Chrysler, better known now as Daimler Chrysler, unveiled no fewer than five concept cars at the Detroit Auto Show. They also announced that at least one, the PT Cruiser, would go into production. PT goes back to, we see this vehicle as appealing to a wide range of people, including young professionals. And we see it as everybody that wants to take their friends, so they want to put the seats down and make the cargo floor or take the rear seats out and put bikes or whatever in there. It's what they want to make of the vehicle. And so the PT stands for their personal transportation. You look at the vehicle, you know, you, you, you see some of the Chrysler heritage in it, especially when you look at the front, you look at the grille. And I think what we've, we've been able to do with this vehicle that we've kind of done with other vehicles with Chrysler recently, even like when we did the 300M, we brought that Chrysler heritage, maybe it's from the 30s, maybe it's from the 40s, and we brought that forward, but we still have a design that's, that's contemporary when you look at it. When you look at the headlamps, you see that it's a contemporary design. It's an all-new platform. It's basically all-new sheet metal, all-new interior, and most of the underbody is all-new. Uh, when we release the vehicle for North America, it will be powered by a 2.4-liter, four-cylinder, dual-overhead cam engine, and it'll both have both automatic and manual transmissions available. We're also going to sell it internationally. It's going to come out in the 2000 calendar year. Uh, we're real excited about it. It's a five-passenger vehicle, but as you know, it has a look that's not like anything else. Our Midas tip of the week concerns aerodynamics. Now using the term aerodynamics when talking about a full-size sport utility like this may seem like a contradiction in terms, but believe me, the engineers tried to make the best of a bad situation. When we add accessories, things like this bug deflector on the front of this vehicle, we can seriously upset the airflow in the vehicle. Just a while ago we had a customer with a very similar vehicle complaining about blurred vision in both side view mirrors at highway speeds. And the situation was they had a bug deflector on the front that was altering the airflow over the sides of the vehicle and causing the mirrors to dance at highway speeds. Other things that can upset the airflow over your vehicle, simply by not clearing the ice and snow off the hood and roof in the winter time can really cause a lot of drag. And in the summertime, running with the side windows down is another thing that'll cause a lot of drag on your vehicle. And these things can add up to decreased fuel mileage. That's your Midas tip of the week. What a gal. What a night. What a car. Four decades and 13 million sales after its introduction, the Chevrolet Impala remains the best-selling full-size automotive nameplate in history. So it was with great anticipation when the world media gathered at the International Auto Show for the unveiling of the newly designed Impala for the year 2000. Ladies and gentlemen, meet the new flagship, the new American icon for the next century, the Chevrolet Impala. <laughs> With the exception of some scattered applause, most journalists sat in stunned silence. First impression, uh, not, not very good. Uh, I thought it was kind of disappointing. Uh, it's not very exciting. It's kind of bland. Uh, it looks like pieces of several other cars thrown together. Quite frankly, I don't know what market they're, they're going to sell it in. It's, you know, I don't know what they're heading for. The styling is old, uh, boring. <laughs> okay, uh, I, I could probably have two separate sets of thoughts on the new Impala. One set is a nameplate thought. The other set is uh, the car and the way it appears thought. Uh, the nameplate thing, great. We looked at uh, 59 Impalas and we looked at 65 Impalas. Good grief, they sold 1.1 million 65 Impalas. They were big blocks and they had air and they had all the great stuff in them, you know, that we expected from cars of that era. But that was that era. This car isn't of that era and I think that even though the Impala SS of three or four years ago was just a knockout car, there's no question about that, anybody that has Impala thoughts in their mind do not envision this car. 
I guess if you're marketing people, say, let's use the old Impala name because we want to take advantage of the cachet that the Impala name has to bring people into the showroom, probably not the plan. They probably would have been better uh, to give that vehicle an entire new name, new marketing, new everything, put everything in the windshield, and forget looking in the rearview mirror. Because I think it's a good car. It's an excellent car. It's certainly well engineered. But the tool they use to bring the people in may not be the correct one to expose them to the vehicle to guarantee the sales of need. It'll be interesting to watch how they how they keep with the marketing plan. I think that, that everybody was hoping that maybe they might outdo the uh, SS that they a couple years ago, and uh, instead it uh, looks like they went backwards again. Now, a lot of the manufacturers like BMW have this particular technology, but in Mercedes' case with the new S-Class, it's called Parktronic. Now, what it is is they have sensors in the front and the rear of the vehicle. And as you get closer and closer to an object, you get not only an audio, but a visual warning. Now, when that object is a hidden cement barrier and your vehicle is worth over $100,000, hey, this is technology I could live with. All right, now let's head to the garage and join Bill Gardner. Brad, you ought to be ashamed of yourself for not denouncing such foolishness in automotive technology. I can't believe it. Anybody that needs a system like that on their car ought to be turning their driver's license in. Anyhow, what I want to talk about this week is alternator problems on cars. And this is a component, the alternator, that we're replacing at a tremendous clip these days. Rarely a day goes by at our shop that we aren't replacing one of these items. And it could be any make and model of car. And one of the biggest reasons that these things fail is heat. Now it's the alternator's job to keep the battery fully charged and to sustain all the electrical devices that are on your car. And on today's cars, I'm sure you know that electrical loads can be plenty. Now the typical amperage for today's alternators is usually in around 100 amps, and in some cases in excess of 100 amps. Some cars have 100, 120 amp alternators. Now an alternator can produce an awful lot of heat just on its own without any other factor. Now if you add into the equation the fact that this thing in this particular front wheel drive car is located behind the engine, right at the back of the engine bay in this area. It's also at the, almost the highest point of the engine bay. So all the air that's blowing back through the radiator and across this engine ends up in this area right here. And on a hot summer's day, the air, the air in this area right here around the alternator could be several hundred degrees Fahrenheit. Now you can see that on the front of the alternator we've got a fan right here and at the back there's another internal fan to try and move air across this alternator and cool it. There's a lot of cooling slots in here and in the back we'll see some fins to cool the rectifier. But if the air in this vicinity is several hundred degrees Fahrenheit, it doesn't offer much of a cooling medium. There is a solution. Now we're under the hood of another Pontiac Grand Am with exactly the same engine and exactly the same electrical accessories. But there's one key difference in terms of the alternator and that's how it breathes. If you look back here at the back of the engine bay, this 97 model has a duct right across here that brings cold air from the base of the windshield. Remember when the hood's closed it's sealed off across here. And this duct is going to bring cold air from the base of the windshield down through the duct and over here to the back of the alternator. Now I, I unplugged part of the electrical harness so you can see this duct continue right through the back of the alternator. Now the alternator doesn't have to breathe that, that several hundred de degree Fahrenheit air that's under the hood of this car in the summertime. It can get cool air to cool the rectifier and all the other components inside this alternator from the base of the windshield. And this duct is going to be responsible for adding a lot of life to this alternator. Now in this particular car, the Grand Am, 96 and newer models have this air duct. But here's one important thing to remember. If your vehicle has this kind of an air duct, the whole thing could be defeated by garbage like this. Maple keys and pine needles collected at the back of the hood. I just plucked these ones out of this very car. Now, if enough of them get across there, obviously it'll restrict the airflow and defeat this system. So once in a while, have a look back there and make sure that that thing isn't, isn't uh, plugged up with debris. And if it is, vacuum it out of there. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 99. While you're out cruising cyberspace, why not pull into MotoringTV.com? There you'll find an extensive link to everything automotive, including test drives, Midas tips, and Kenzie's Corner. MotoringTV.com is best viewed with Autopilot by Romulan and can be downloaded right from our site.
A few years ago, an American historian named Francis Fukuyama, and I hope I got that name right, declared that once the Cold War was over, history was finished. Well, I guess he forgot about Serbs. But I kind of got thinking of that when we saw the press preview for the Mercedes-Benz S-Class. Now they spent their entire time talking about this command system, about how it works, the navigation system and the radio and the air conditioning and all that stuff. And I started thinking, what about the suspension? What about the brakes? What about the engine? Well, they mentioned the engine for about 32 seconds. And I started to think, you know, maybe Fukuyama was right. Maybe history is over. Maybe cars have got as good as they're going to get. All that's left is to put more and more technology into the car, and most of it seems to be dedicated towards absolving the driver of any involvement whatsoever. You push a button that says, turn right, turn left, you don't have to do anything anymore. And if you do have a crash, of course, 97 airbags come out and protect you from getting hurt. The phone rings automatically. Somebody in Dallas, Texas says, hey, are you all right? You're on Route 19 and you're heading 47 miles an hour southbound. Oh, I actually asked her, her name was Monique, she was very nice. I asked her, is the woman next to me married to me? And that kind of threw her. She didn't have that information and it was probably just as well. But you know, I'm beginning to wonder, am I just eligible for the next uh, version of grumpy old men? Or maybe somebody has to give me the address of the Morgan Owners Club, because I'm getting a little tired of this technology. I mean, we're here at Niagara Falls, maybe we should just pitch it over the falls. I'm Jim Kenzie. Well, you know, Jim wasn't the only grumpy old man. A lot of the journalists were rather resistant to all this technology, maybe a little intimidated by this 300-page owner's manual and another 200-page manual on the command system alone. But as Mercedes predicted, after a couple of days with this car, even a guy like me who's still trying to figure out how to send and receive email, well, I'm getting used to it. And you know what? With a V8 with some 300 horsepower in this S500, I could learn to live with it. That's it for now. We'll see you next time out as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. They're there to help them. They're not going to try to go for their pocketbook as everybody thinks in all these crazy books and things we read. And I think people should try and quit thinking about this stereotype because it's just like any other business. TSN's Motoring 99 has been brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oils, formulated for the vehicles you drive and the way you drive them. And Midas Car Care, the way it should be.